So right now we've got the grain in the hot water and the temperature of the water was right around 170 degrees and given the amount of grain that we have in there to the amount of water it should be dropping it down to right around 150 degrees and at that point the amylase enzymes that are in the barley are going to convert the starches that are in the barley into fermentable sugars so that the yeast will be able to consume those sugars and produce alcohol. Okay. Cool. And then how long do we leave it up there for? Uh, it's going to be about a half an hour. Until it reduces the temperature or until you, you feel it's it's Until broken. it's performed the task of uh, starch conversion. And that just takes about a half an hour. It actually technically only takes five to seven minutes, mm -hmm. but uh, it's good to give it a little longer, allow the water to actually permeate all the way throughout the grain so that we will be able to rinse all those sugars out. Okay, later. okay. That makes sense. So if we were going all grain, you would want to use 170 degree water, yeah. not not 130, which you're going to get out of my tap. Exactly. Okay. Okay. But this is perfectly, perfectly and this, reasonable for that. This washes the sugars out of the uh, out of the grains for yep. fermentation later. That is correct. Okay. If we had a functioning wort chiller right now, we would do a full boil. But since we don't, we'll just do a small boil and. About a gallon is the minimum we want to put through here just to make sure we get at least most of the sugars out. But since we're not doing a full boil with a wort chiller, we want to keep it keep the batch small so that the heat or the, the heat from the water will drain off eventually. Precisely. Or quicker than otherwise would be done with yep. out the wort chiller. Yep. Okay. Water bath will not chill five gallons quite as easy as it will for a half or three. <laughs> yeah. Uh how, like, is it bad to let them, to take too long to chill, or is it just a pain in the butt? It's a pain in the butt, and it's, you're going to end up losing some of your uh, some of your oils from the hops, so you're going to end up losing a little bit of the aroma. Oh, okay, they'll degrade from being in the heat for too long? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so what is this stuff, then? Uh, it's malt syrup. Mm -hmm. how so, it? it's essentially like uh, how we had the grain steeping there before. This is... Uh, made out of base malt, just uh, just two row. Mm -hmm. uh, your base grain for where you get most of the sugars from most of your standard beers, and then it's been concentrated down into syrup form so that you know, if you don't have the ability to do a full mash yourself at home, mm -hmm. you can use uh, malt syrup or dry malt extract, which is a powdered version of this, yeah, uh, to make your beer and the the full the full grain the uh, process just takes more space and equipment it, yeah it takes up more space and more equipment if you're doing a five gallon batch all grain you know you're going to need to have like a vessel this size specifically just for holding your grain when you're brewing okay and uh yeah it's a lot more equipment yeah Your, your Munich malt being one of your uh, specialty grains that's going in here is a base malt for certain types of beer, but as far as most beers are considered, it is a specialty grain, despite the fact that it is a fully modified base malt. It's not like your crystal malts that are going in there or in other beers like roasted barleys okay. or toasted grains that are generally reducing the diastatic power. And diastatic power is? Its ability to convert uh, starches to sugars. Starches. So it's, it's pretty much... Uh, Referring to its ability to have functional amylase enzyme, enzymes in it still. Which are? The uh, enzyme that converts the starch to sugar. Okay, right. Okay, so that I get you, I get you. The diastatic power is its ability to actually have these enzymes that yeah, I mean, do when, the Yeah, once you have like, your, your burnt roasted grains, uh, despite the fact that they are originating from something that does have amylase enzymes in it that are fully functioning, once you heat it up to a certain degree, you denature that enzyme, and it no longer will work. Uh, when you're boiling it, when you're reducing the volume, I mean, that's that's part of it. If you're doing a full boil, uh, you need to reduce the volume, but we're not mm. doing a full boil. There's still compounds in there that we need to evaporate, uh, like DMS. DMS is uh, dimethyl sulfide, and if you end up having that in your beer, then it's going to end up giving it uh, flavors like uh, burnt plastic, Oh, corn. Yeah, you don't uh, want that in your beer. No, no, no. So boiling with the lid off is critical. Okay, okay. <laughs> when you're bringing it up to a boil, you add the hops. 
sweetness to it, mm -hmm. and it ends up giving you a different kind of flavor than you would get otherwise. Okay. And it adds bitterness, you say? A little bit, but not as much as it would if you uh, put it in after the boil has began. Oh, okay. Yeah. Something about ice omelet. Or, you know, the first word addition isn't uh, a normal thing for most beers, but mm -hmm. it's a good way to get an amount of hot flavor that you wouldn't get otherwise. Okay. So with things like IPAs and Imperial IPAs and sometimes with pale ales, it's yeah. a good move. At that point, we'll have the hot break. You know, the proteins in there are going to uh, start separating. We're going to get some horrible foaming issues and try not to boil over, which is mm. really easy in the pot right now since we're only like... Yeah, it's a nice big... Full. <laughs> nice tall pot for that. Yep. Okay. Uh, but yeah, once once the hot break happens, we can start adding our bitter and hot. It's called the hot break? Yep, and then we have the cold break later when we're cooling down and all those proteins start separating it out and they look like chunks of junk in there. Okay, okay. The next edition is going to be 45 minutes after that hits the word. So what is this edition for? This is the bittering edition. It's going to be where we get uh, most of the bitterness from uh, the beer. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need your bitterness to balance out the sugars that are left behind after fermentation from the non-fermentable sugars. Okay. Is there a, 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 an official name for it? Or? Uh, well, this one, it, it's gone in 15 minutes to the end of the boil. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it's essentially a flavor addition. And the, the, the full boil is 60 minutes? Yeah, uh, 60 or 90, 75 sometimes. It's really kind of depending. But anything that goes in uh, before the 45 minutes to the end of the boil mark, you're really not going to get much by way of aroma or flavor at that point. It's pretty much just bitterness. Okay. Aside from, like, when you're doing a first word addition. Um so adding it at this point you're getting a little bit of bitterness but not much and you're getting a lot of flavor out of it and very little aroma uh the last top edition here uh it's gone in within uh five minutes to the end of the boil that's where you're going to get virtually no bitterness and very little flavor but primarily aroma oh, okay it's just getting the oils into solution uh, but with uh, but only boiling them long enough to not break them down exactly okay okay that makes sense Okay. So we can put the lid back on, it's fine, and theoretically it's going to maybe hold in some of the okay. uh, aromatic characteristics. You don't lose all of them anyway, uh, but cooling it down quick is where you're going to help keep in a lot of that aroma. But we're also dry hopping this mm. guy, so. So how, uh, how far are we cooling it down? Uh, we're going to get it down to about 75. Okay, and that's uh, the point at which you add the yeast, right? The, yep, the pitch. at that point, yep. And uh, this, you know, we're going to end up watering it down a little bit anyway to get it up to the, or almost five gallon mark. Since you've got a five gallon carboy here, we're actually probably going to go to about four and a half gallons right oh, now. Oh, okay. So. Pitching, it's going to sometimes end up fermenting out more than it ought to, uh -huh. but it also can end up getting lazy yeast where your yeast ends up fermenting out, you know, a, to a certain point and then just drops out of solution. Okay, so if it ferments too much, it gets too dry, you said? Yeah. And that means it's too alcoholic? Uh, no, too dry, it's uh, gonna end up being uh, low gravity, you know, you're gonna end up having something with very little body. Oh, okay. Real okay. thin. Yeah. The yeast that you brought from your brewery, yep. um, is that something that, that people could expect wherever they are? Like, you, you swing into a local brewery and say, hey, can I have some of your yeast? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can get it at most breweries. Most of them are going to be really nice about it. They'll yeah. tell you what it is. Uh, ours, it's a proprietary strain, which is uh, uh, a mutated British ale yeast strain. So mm -hmm. it accentuates malt characteristics. Uh, quite a bit, so you're going to get good malt character out of it. If it ferments too warm, it's going to be a little too fruity, but uh, mm. it also really carries hop character too, so if you keep the temperature down, which is what I always do when I'm brewing with it, uh, you know, right around the 68 to 70 degree range. Mm -hmm. really okay. Really good for British style and American style ales. Yeah across the board, and it'll also ferment fairly cold around 60 to 62, so you can end up uh, making pulses and German ales with it. 
Oh, so it's pretty versatile. Very. Do you use the same yeast for all the beers? Uh, yeah, aside from, like, uh, that Pilsner I brought over. Hmm, okay, that takes a special yeast. Yeah, you gotta have lager yeast for that. Okay. 